My name is Dr. Zhang. My name is Nusrat Zhang. I am a professor in Lila School of Civil Engineering. We have quite many areas and my focus area is architectural engineering. And today I'm here to talk about the most exciting time we are having on campus. So I'll start the presentation and speak about Z-Edge and what we are doing in architectural engineering. Okay, so here you're looking at a picture of Z-Edge. Z-Edge stands for Zero Energy Design Guidance for Engineers. This is our new test facility. Um, I'm going to go through the entire design process of how it came to be and where we are at today and the experiments that are ongoing currently. The students who participated in it involves Motasam Kadan, Aditya, Changbo, Reno, Charlotte, uh, PhD students Xiaozhu, Daniel, and Jingling. So a little bit about the architectural engineering program at Civil Engineering at Purdue. We are six professors. Uh, the first picture you see is that of Professor Panayota Karava. Uh, she studies also energy sustainability and buildings. Then you have Professor Ming Chu. She is focused on building controls. Then you are seeing me and I'll speak more about, a lot more about buildings. Dr. Bohr, Brandon E. Bohr is working on indoor air quality and Dr. Thanos Tempelikos works on lightings and buildings. <laughs> Professor Travis Horton is also into all kinds of building systems and compressors and building performance. So in our program, we really focus on buildings and architectural engineering is truly an amalgamation of multiple fields. So you are talking about a combination of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, civil engineering, and all the things that go on within buildings because buildings are a very important part of our society, right? So why do we care about energy and why it is important to us is because they consume about 40% of all energy that is produced. And in somewhat in that process, because of the associated electricity that we are generating is accounting for 40% of greenhouse emissions, gas emissions in the United States. And overall, if we were to think of it at a personal level, all of us, who live in homes pay about $1,400 in cost. And this is a very small number because it really depends on your usage criteria and how you occupy those buildings. So this is a picture that talks about the share of total US energy consumption by end user sector. So if you look at the Right side, you would see that residential buildings account for 20%, commercial buildings account for 18%, industrial 32, and transportation 29. On the left side, you see how we are actually generating the primary energy by using natural resources, such as coal, natural gas, nuclear, and of course, renewables, which are in the green. So to give you some context about, because it's, it's quite easy to understand energy when you talk about the house you are living in or the house that uh, you might have lived in while growing up. So when we are looking at the overall aspect of what's happening in a residential building about 9% of energy is going to heating the space during winter time. About 18% is going to cooling the space during the summer time. And we all use hot water. About 9% of the energy is going to that. And lighting also plays a very important role. Now, if you look at the electronics and computers, which is miscellaneous, that sums up to be quite large, about 31%. 
And of course, we have a bunch of appliances that we use in our daily lives, and they account for about 13%. So this is a breakdown of a residential building that we have here on campus uh, called as Renew House, which is also a renewable house, which was retrofitted. So you are seeing the big breakdown of the energy bills that we receive after having used it for a period of one year. So to bring all of this in context to all our students, we want to really help you understand and give you context in a very, very compact way what is energy efficiency? What are the parameters that are involved in evaluating energy efficiency? And what it is that you learn during our graduate program that actually helps you evaluate these criteria that lead to consumption of energy. So we came up with this idea of presenting all the technologies in a very compact form. It is a tiny house. It is a zero energy tiny house, which actually has almost everything that you have in a home. And the beauty of it is that it's mobile. So we can take it anywhere we like and run all kinds of experiments to better understand climate zones. Uh, I'll speak a little bit more about that in the next slide. So here, we, I'm, I wanted to show you how the design process looked like. So we started about an year and a half ago, and this is a picture of last summer. And in the picture, you're looking at Mo, Adate, and Chenbo, and we have this large room and set of criterias on the left side about what exactly do we want this building to be? What kind of performance metrics it is going to have? So you are looking right now at the sketches of the right solar angle that is needed to produce the solar energy and how we arrived at that discussion. Um, and this is a picture in a meeting room. We had multiple meetings over the course of three months while we designed it. This is may look complicated, but it's in crux, you are looking at the two different kinds of insulation. So building insulation is something that helps prevent the cold to come indoors when it is really cold outdoors. And it also prevents the cold from going out from inside during the summer months. So you are conditioning the air and you want your building envelope to be very, very efficient so that it can retain very good thermal comfort while you are indoors. However, to arrive at that thermal comfort, we have to choose the properties of our building envelope. So in a way that it actually performs um, as we want it to perform. Of course, all of us want to be comfortable indoors. So you are looking at two different kinds of insulation systems. We have closed cell spray foam in two of the walls and we have uh, XPS foam in two of the walls. We wanted to have different insulation yet the same thermal performance given that we are able to test in our new laboratory facilities how each of these materials perform and the tiny house presents a realistic example of applying those numbers in a real building. Um, this is a picture of yakisugi panels. So outside you have seen that the color of Z-Ash looks about black and gold. Those are our Purdue colors and we went with a very old Japanese technique that is over 3,000 years old, where you treat the front surface, the top surface of the wood, with heat in a way that it closes all the cellulose bonds, and it allows the wood to have a very long life so that the water cannot permeate 
permeate through it. And at the same time, we are preventing it from getting any sort of infestation such as termites and so on. So we are hoping that this would live for hundreds of years. And uh, this is a picture of how the Yakisugi panels are actually made. We went with a very controlled factory made process. However, we tested the materials out before we made our choices. Then I'm also teaching a class on building information modeling. So of course, when you are making these decisions, you want the right tools and you also want to evaluate these performance metrics. So we created building information 3D models that contained the data of performance of each element of the building. And based on those quantitative assessments, we could have we could make good choices, we could make optimal choices. So these are almost the final design stage pictures. We had a large window that we split in two towards the final design. So this is a picture of the trailer it is actually built on. So the trailer had to be very specifically designed to carry the weight of the building. So since we have an entire solar system on it, so we had it made for about 6, 16,000 pounds. So it can carry about 16,000 pounds and our Z edge tiny house weighs about 13,000 pounds. So this is a very complex design problem because this is something that is going to be on the road. It could be on a highway, you're driving 60 miles per hour. So how do you make sure that your building is not just performing very well, but structurally sound to be mobile? And the advantages of having something mobile is that you are able to really take it anywhere you like. And each of the climate zone is very different and so are the building performance metrics. So these are the final renderings that you are looking at coming from the BIM model and amalgamation of multiple softwares. I believe this was in SketchUp in the last stages to see how the renderings look like. Inside you enter the Z edge and on the right side you see a slat wall and this slat wall hides the solar system behind it because we wanted to have a very contained area for all the solar components. You have multiple energy efficient appliances so you have a full scale kitchen. You have a refrigerator, a dishwasher, an oven, induction cooktop. And of course, we are generating a lot of indoor pollutants while we are doing our everyday activities. So that led us to come up with a very good ventilation system that need to be in place to exhaust those pollutants. The windows that you are looking at are also high performance and they are specifically designed for Indiana climate zone following the ASHRAE standards. This is another picture. This is a feature window and here we will be, so this presents us with a great optimization problem. We will be actually able to study what is the impact of indirect light and the direct light. So since this is something mobile, we cannot have overhangs that would act as a shading device. So we instead went with protruding it inside and on the inside part, you see where, where there is no window, that's where your solar system is hiding. So these are some pictures uh, of the construction. So after having worked on all of these problems for about three months, we searched quite a lot for finding the right contractor since we were looking for very specific building performance metric. We wanted it to be built as the choices we made and we partnered with Mitchcraft Tiny Homes. It's a company based in Colorado. And these are the pictures of the structural frame that was built on top of the trailer. 
And the next layer of the wall that you're looking at is a zip system. It allows us to have a very well enclosed thermal envelope. So right after the zip system comes your sheathing, the outside one, and on top of that, you have to have some sort of furring. Furring is what it is called, so that you can place the buttons of the Akisugi panels on top of that. And uh, these screenshots are taken from Mitch Crofts Instagram. It was very exciting for us to follow the process of how it was coming along. Inside, you are able to see <clears throat> the pictures of the closed cell spray foam insulation and how that actually helps us have a certain thermal performance to maintain the thermal comfort. And you are currently only looking at the spray foam while the other blocks that are empty have the XPS foam. So this is the service wall of the tiny house. So two walls serve as where all the plumbing and electrical connections are. You're looking at the breaker box, which is all the electricals that are running in these two walls. You are looking at half part of the mini split system. I will show you what a split system is and how we can provide heating and cooling. This is a small exhaust fan for the bathroom because we want all the humidity that is gen being generated indoors to be exhausted to avoid any kind of mold issues or condensation issues that we can have. We have a kitchen exhaust, which you see here, and a window on the loft, and this is in the kitchen. So this is currently standing right in front of the Hampton Hall, and you are very welcome to visit our campus and have a look at it. These are again pictures of kitchen and while it was still in the works, though in this picture you are able to see how the solar components are coming together one at a time. And these are the other pictures of indoor spaces. So you enter from this door, you go in, you have a long kitchen island then you have all of your service areas such as bathroom and on top you have the staircase right going up to the loft area. Then we have a very proper gutter system because of course again this is something that is not a usual building so we want the water to be going away. We have different types of tanks that are embedded inside the trailer bed to make sure that we have actual water. So these are the little details. And this is again still during the construction process of how our optimized window came to be while it was being constructed. So in summary, we started the decision makings from the building and block. We calculated what is the wall to wall ratio, how much external wall do we have, what is the internal floor values? What should be the type of windows we should have? What kind of solar shading are we going to receive? Because remember, this is something mobile. So this is a non-typical building. That means we might be driving from this direction on the road or that direction on the road. And how would the solar shading work interior-wise and exterior-wise? Then what is the thermal mass of each of these components because they are all exposed to the building environment. So since it is not on a foundation, it's above. So how do you make sure that that space is well sealed? Then of course we have high performance lighting. We have very controlled heating, ventilation, air conditioning. We have controlled relative humidity. We have appliances that consume very little an energy. And then what are the building services involved in it? And in terms of renewable energy, we are producing energy using solar and solar panels. So what we plan to do really is that we will run actual simulated activities inside the tiny house where you are able to learn how much energy you are consuming 
in how much energy you are producing and what would be the other solutions that would help uh, in generating energy that is something a non-typical household, right? So this is how they started and ultimately arrived at the final design, which is now on campus. So you're looking up the other facades of the tiny house. So these two walls do not have the service components, but mostly the performance components. And these are the two front walls. So here is the breaker box that is open and we have just started a new collaboration. So we had new instruments come in to sense what is going inside. This is the water connection to the main water line of the house. And here is the electrical connection for pumps. And this is where our wastewater is going to a gutter right next. So here you're just looking at a zero air cylinder because we needed to run the experiments. But this is another angle of the, of the ZH tiny house. Then this is how it looks like currently. You see here a ventilator, a powered ventilator. So we installed this right here in the loft because Currently, there is a lack of regulations for small spaces such as that of tiny houses. And as part of the building code, it is not required. However, we really needed a way to bring in filtered outdoor air. So right here, you are looking at a MERV 16 filter. So you are, of course, able to exhaust the air. But how can we bring in clean air, not without the windows in a very controlled fashion. So this is now installed right here in this space. This is the picture of the connection of our wastewater that is being generated um, inside the house by the activities that you are uh, we are using the house. So basically you'll be able to learn almost about everything that has to do with buildings and building services, building components, energy efficiency, building technologies, building services, building controls. So we are able to really um, study and learn and carry out cutting edge research on all of these subjects by use of this new test facility. This is a picture of the mini split unit. So when you pull up the cover, you're looking at the heating and the cooling coils and how it is providing us with both possibilities. And the unit is called a mini split because you have an indoor unit and you have an outdoor unit. This is something rather common in very old buildings that are ref retrofitted to be energy efficient. Um, it is quite challenging to have a small space that you need to heat and cool so you do not have full-scale systems that we do have in our laboratory facilities to test. So this, was, this is an alternative way of heating and cooling. So this is again the picture of the powered ventilator that I mentioned is installed. So you're looking at the filter right here and this is our control mechanism where we can actually monitor the airflow. And we have a pitot tube going out of here because we want to maintain about zero <clears throat> or neutral pressure inside while we are running the experiments. So we are able to actually control the airflow very well to have a single zone mixed reactor. That is something that we need when we run controlled experiments. So here is a picture of the bathroom exhaust. And what you notice is that we are able to modulate the amount of relative humidity and at what degree do we need to run the fan on. So I can change it depending on the sensor system that is installed there, which is automatically going to sense so that we are able to really control the environment while we carry out our experiments. Um, this was very fun for us. We were delighted to be uh, as top news story at Life at Purdue. We 
we were all very welcome to follow it. And it was very exciting for our team to be present there. So we have quite many stories that have come out of uh, this new facility. It has actually just arrived about two months ago. And uh, you are very welcome to read more about it. And uh, those were the links. So I wanted to share, okay, we have this great facility and how can we apply it? So currently we are studying, uh, we have quite many sensors installed in this and we are studying what is the indoor environmental quality. And you are looking at the multiple exhaust systems. And then here we have a very sensitive particle sizer. So we are able to understand um, what is in the air that is inside. We have pressure gauge, we have um, different types of sensors for um, NO and NO2. We have the Weissler sensor to better understand what is the exact relative humidity that gives me a very, very accurate value. We are also learning about ozone. We have CO2 analyzer. And this is one of the, really the most cutting edge instrument called as proton transfer reaction time of flight mass spec. So by use of this instrument, we are able to learn what is happening inside is second by second. So um, we are running very controlled measurement campaign, which is currently ongoing. And hopefully you'll be able to see some of these sensors in the video that is prepared by my students. They are, uh, it's Reno and Charlotte who worked on it. And this is about seven minutes long. And here, both of them are going to walk you through the tiny house one step at a time. So here we go. Purdue's net zero tiny house. My name is Rina Sarusi. I'm a junior at Purdue. And I'll be taking you on a tour today of some of the functions of Z-Edge and how they apply to architectural engineering. To begin, Z-Edge is slightly larger than the average Google tiny house at 24 by eight feet. The house is illuminated by three outdoor lights, two of which are outside the doors and another uh, alongside the wall. Directly above the lights is the integrated gutter system which distributes water on both sides of the tiny house. Moving to the back, we have our exhaust fan and air vents. These connect directly to the Dolkin mini split unit just below. To the left of this, we have our breaker box, which has several main disconnect switches. The top switch connects to the main power grid, and the bottom connects to the solar charged battery, with the remainder of the switches connecting to the other appliances in the house. On the east facing side, we have two other vents connecting to the kitchen exhaust and the bathroom vent. Below those, we have our outside outlet as well as our main water inlet. This connects under the sink, we can see it better inside. Towards the bottom is our wastewater line, which will deliver gray and black water from the house to a local sewer system. Touching briefly on the siding, it is a type of wood called yakasuki, which is a Japanese cypress tree that is burned. Uh, this reduces rotting and weather deterioration. Here we also have a concave window. This is used to test the shading and indirect sunlight on effects on the tiny house. And an adjustable step is included for ease of access into the tiny house. One of the most important features of the tiny house is the solar panels on the roof. And here we have a picture. There are six solar panels, each 325 watts. With that, uh, we'll move inside of the tiny house. Currently, there is some testing going on, so there will be equipment. Generally, that should not be an issue for this tour, although there may be some spots a little bit tighter than they might have been before. I'm going to have a quick shot of the tiny house just showing some of the features. So first, we will be 
slide access wall. This houses our solar battery system. Given the equipment, it is going to be a little tough to get a good angle, but I'll do my best. So here we've got our system diagnostics showing our readout on our Anchorage. Uh, below that we have our AC DC converter. And then on the floor, we have our lithium ion battery. Back towards the top. On the left, we have our outgoing wire to the breaker box. And on the right, that wire receives the current from the solar panels. Moving on, we have our appliances under the countertop. Uh, currently, the fridge has been removed for equipment usage, but we still have a sink. On the sink, like I mentioned earlier, we have our main water inlet. With the flow gauge here, we can evaluate which appliances are using the most amount of water in the dining house. This is very important and can give us a better idea of which appliances are most sustainable. Moving forward, we have our dishwasher to the left, as well as our oven and range. Both these appliances draw a pretty heavy current and require larger wiring. So just to the left, we can see that large metal wire that carries the current to those appliances. Moving on. Bathroom is just to the left. So we have a shower, standard. Behind those is our sink. This cabinet houses the water outlet for the washer dryer to the left, as well as the sink. Uh, we also have some wires in there. Let's see the research. So again, there's a washer dryer in here that saves a lot of space, not having both appliances. And then above that, we have a water heater. This connects to our main water heater and delivers hot water to all of the appliances that need it around the house. To the left of that, we have our staircase as well as several cabinets. Depending on the occupants, these cabinets can be housing a lot of different things, but it comes to living generally stuff of that nature is what they were designed for. Entering the bedding area, we have our mini split system for inside of the house, as well as our heating and air conditioning. Holding this up, we can get a slight angle on some of those heating coils in there. And then to our right, we have our egress window, as well as our smoke detector. Our smoke detector is towards the bottom of the stairs. You can see it towards the bottom of the screen. And with that, we have gone over uh, most of the main comments of Sea Edge. So that will be the end of the tour. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Answer any of your questions. So it looks like we have one question so far. Would you like for me to read it to you? Okay, I see that from Wade. Okay. Yes. Are the exterior walls two by four at 16 on center, or did they use advanced framing and use two by six at 24 on center? 
Why did you use one over the other? All right, Wade, very good question. So we have two by fours at some places at 16 and some places two by four is six. So when you are building on a trailer, you have to think about it in terms of center of gravity and where and how your weight is being distributed all over the trailer because we cannot have a lot of weight at the front or a lot of weight at the back or a lot of weight in the center. So this, all of this needs to be structurally very properly being transferred. And while there is weight on half of the roof of the solar and then you have all the systems and then you have under the trailer bed water tanks, we have to ensure that this is very well distributed since it is going to be on the road. So it's a mix of all and uh, it's not very easy to think about it in terms of one or the other. So it depends on where is what load and how would you distribute it? Uh, I hope I answered your question. Oh, very nice. So please come see me if you are at Purdue. <laughs> I'd be happy to talk with you. We still have uh, we still have about ten minutes left. I think it is okay to have a conversation if you'd like to speak. Yeah, I'll have a conversation. Hello, Reed. How are you? Good. So you are designing your own tiny house. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Tell us about it. Tell us. So where, what do you plan to do? Is it going to be on a trailer? Is it some other method? So I've been, I'm more in like a preliminary stage because I'm about to graduate from my undergrad, uh, but I want to get my master's in structural, but I also like the travel. So like I've been looking into the ideas of it and living more like energy efficient and whatnot. So I've been kind of doing a little bit of research into the different stuff. And I was going to build it myself because I, my dad owns a construction company. Mm -hmm. So like we know how to build. And yeah, I was planning to do it on like a trailer and I was still debating on how big, what size I would want, but I was just kind of going through some of the ideas why some people use like certain methods and whatnot. Yeah, it's quite complicated, but I think you will figure it out as you will proceed with design. So I think what you need to consider is what do you want to put on that trailer? Because you need to understand how much weight can it take mm -hmm. and how would you distribute the load? So your two by fours at 16 or two by six at 24 would come on the basis of what kind of load is going where. Right. So you have to really think about all of these things together at the same time, which makes it a complex problem. But uh, most of the tiny house builders, if you will follow then they are using most of the time two by fours at 16. So it really, really depends on how specific your design is and what is it that you want to put on it, but make sure that the load is evenly distributed throughout because this is something going to be on the road. So you want to make sure that your trailer is balanced, right? Yeah. And then it needs to be, um, so there is something called as Recreational Vehicle Industry Association, RVIA, and they are rating the trailer to be on the road. So you want to make sure that you meet their requirements when you think about purchasing the trailer, because ultimately you'd like to have a number plate on it and have it registered and so on. So that is very important to consider. The other thing um, that I can tell you that the height is a big restriction. So you yeah. are, you are, you're restricted with 13 feet, six inches. And if you build at 13 feet six, it would settle about an inch while it is on the road, eventually after the construction is done. So um, make sure to include that as a thought because, because well, you have to go under the bridges. So <laughs> why we travel? So yeah. they, will, they will make it very difficult. 
uh, if these requirements are not met to be on the road. Okay. And then look into NOAA certification and OAH. So you want to make sure that all of your electricals are based on national electric code because you, of mm -hmm. course, want to be very safe and it's a small space. Yeah. Yeah. So I also hold the general contractor's license too. Okay, great. There you go. You're all ready. So you, <laughs> you're all ready to get going with your tiny house. Yes, it's very, very exciting. I think a lot of the younger generation is very interested in this alternative way of living. Mm -hmm. and I think it provides us with a great opportunity. Are you studying at Purdue at the moment or? Not at the moment. I'm, I'm at Valparaiso University it's in Northwest Indiana. Okay. You're very welcome to come to our campus to check out our tiny house and learn more about our program. So whenever uh, I am teaching on campus actually uh, despite the COVID situation. However, we have very carefully um, executed environments. So we are all wearing masks, we are social distancing, we are all taking all the safety and the measures very, very cautiously. And But it seems to be going well. And if you happen to be in the area, please come join us and have a look at our tiny house. Yep, I would, I'd love to. I'm actually down there quite often because my girlfriend goes to Purdue. Okay, so you're very welcome. Let me know, send me an email. You can find my email quite easily, I believe. And I'll be very happy to show it to you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Jasmine, do you have any questions? No, I just want to see your um, presentation. Yes, so we have had a, I'm glad that we had a chance to have a conversation. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation.